Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of A God Shift. I am your host, Shana Rattler, and I am so grateful that you have decided to spend a little bit of time with us today. So before we get started, I want to ask you a favor. So if you will take a screenshot of wherever it is that you are listening to this podcast, so whether it is on your your phone, your tablet, your computer, just take a quick screenshot and then post it on your social media. When you do, I would love for you to tag us here at A God Shift. And then I just want to hear your biggest aha moment or your biggest takeaway from this episode, because I firmly believe that the more times that these episodes are shared, the more lives that we can change. And after all, that's why I do this, not just because I just love to come on here and talk, although I do love to come on here and talk. So we're going to get started. I'm going to read my guest bio, and then we're going to get into what I believe is going to be a pretty great episode. So my guest today hosts the Rethinking Scripture podcast, where he challenges listeners to rethink what they thought they already knew about the Bible. He's been a college athlete, public school teacher, real estate broker, triathlete, small business owner, pastor, tour leader to Israel, and university professor. His biblical training has produced a unique perspectives on some of life's most important themes. He lives in the Pacific Northwest, and I want to welcome to the show Greg Hall. Hey, thank you for having me on today. I'm really excited about this conversation. Yes, I'm excited too. So let's give a little bit of context to this conversation because my platforms and my ministry are all called a God shift. And most times when people hear that, they're like, ooh, and ah, but nobody has a clue what the heck a God shift is. (laughs) So my definition of a God shift is the moment that we ditch disruption or delay in our lives, collide with God's purpose and move into a greater destiny. And I believe, Greg, that we have a role to play in God's will for our lives. And one of the ways that we can partner with God on this God shift journey is by exercising what I like to call our kingdom authority. It's the actual God-given authority that scripture says that we have. And so I think about kingdom authority and I think about there's all these great things that God can do. He can do anything. Actually, he can be God all by himself, but he actually desires to like co-create with us. And the Bible tells us in multiple scriptures, there's actually 44 times in the Bible that dominion and authority is mentioned. And it tells us all of the different ways that we have power and authority to actually allow, you know, partner with God to make things happen in our lives. And some people hear that and they're like, oh, you can't manipulate God. You can't change timing. And while that may be true, but scripture tells us, here are some things that we can expect God to do. And here are some things that God expects us to do. So I always start all of my episodes off asking my guests, what is your own definition of kingdom authority? Well, that's that's a great question. And it's a great way to start because I have just written a book on rest. And as opposite as rest seems to the idea of kingdom authority and moving into whatever role God has had us, um, the Old Testament idea of rest surprisingly is very well connected with your question of kingdom authority. So we could go to a lot of places in the New Testament, and I'm sure we might end up there uh, a little later in the conversation. But I always like going back to just the very beginning of the creation of the kingdom of Mm -hmm. the whole cosmos back in Genesis. I'm an Old Testament prof. And um, so I really like going back and, and looking through And if you go back to Genesis chapter one, it's right there in verse 26, God said, let us make man, and that's humanity, right? That's humanity in our image, according to our likeness. So we're talking about image bearing. And what is it? How is it that that image bearing is defined? It's in the very end of the same sentence. And let us rule over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the sky, over the cattle, and over all the earth, over every living uh, creeping thing. I I love that creeping thing, that creep on the earth. And then it says in verse 27, God created man in his image, male and female, and he gave them some things to do. So be fruitful and multiply. Obviously, that's one of them. Got to have that. But then there's this rule and subdue. So you've got this idea of ruling. Let them rule in verse 26. and 
let them rule and subdue the earth in verse 28. And that is directly tied, I believe, to the job that we have of bearing God's image here on earth. So when we don't uh, take our authority, our kingdom authority that's been given to all of humanity, some of us do it very well, some of us don't reflect God's image very well within humanity. But when we don't, we're not bearing his image in a proper way. And yeah. when we are able to take up whatever that authority is, and we can talk about that further, but when we are able to take that authority up and do it correctly, then we are bearing God's image to a world that desperately needs to see who God is and know him. I love that you gave that scripture, Greg. So I have what I call anchor scriptures. And I have an anchor scripture for my life, which is Lamentations 3 and 23. But my anchor scripture for my ministry is the scripture that you just gave in Genesis. Oh. Like I said, there's 44 times that the Bible talks about the dominion and authority that we have been given as believers. But that's the one that I kind of anchor my ministry in and go back to, you know, in reference what it is that scripture tells us. And it's like, and like you said, this is not some new thing, you know, not to be confused with new age, but like, this is not a, a new thing. This is not a, after Jesus came on the scene thing. No, from the very beginning, the Lord gave man authority. He gave us dominion. And I'm, I'm always blown away at the number of people that I speak to, whether it is in a ministerial capacity or whether it's just in my day-to-day -day life that have never been told or taught that they have authority. And if they have read some of the scriptures that says that we have authority, even many of the churches these days are not really empowering us and developing us to be able to walk in that authority. So it's like having a key to a house and never putting it in the door and never having a leader that tells you that the key goes to that door and how much better your life will be, how much more grace and ease you can potentially have if you'll just put the key in the door that someone gave you. You know, it's like you come into Dallas and I'm like, hey, Greg, I know that you guys are coming this weekend, but I'm not going to be there right away. But I left a key underneath the mat. And then I get here and you guys are sitting at the front door and I'm like, well, what are you doing? Like, <laughs> why do you need me to come inside? Yeah, right. Exactly. You know, and you're like, oh, well, I was waiting on you to get here. And as crazy as that sounds, that's the way we do God. We've been taught that he's powerful and that he's great and all the things that he is. And I think it puts us in a position where we actually undercompensate for what it is that we have the ability to do and frankly, what it is that he expects us to do. So I'm curious, yeah. you know, in keeping with your, your definition of the authority that we've been given from the beginning of time, I read your bio and all of the great things that you have accomplished. And so I'm just curious in the, on the path of you getting to where it is that you are today, can you tell us about a time that you actually had to buckle down and say, I'm going to have to exercise the authority and do the things that I know that I can do to get where I'm going? Yeah. And uh, hopefully when I tell my story a little bit, uh, it's going to ring true for just about everybody that's listening, because I think uh, what I've experienced largely is just a, a human condition, right? And I like to think about uh, my path and the way I use the authority that God's given me. Uh, there's a fine line between going just roughshod ahead and doing whatever I want to do and being patient and listening. And um, I, I go back to the biblical example of David in the Old Testament. Again, I'm an Old Testament guy. I like some of the stories back there. David interesting character. And I'll get to my story and answer your question in just a second. But as a setup, David, as a young boy, was anointed to be the next king, right? And um, it's interesting how that story goes, because for years after his anointing, he doesn't take the role of king. In, in fact, King Saul, who was the man in, in that position of power, his anointing's removed, and yet he stays in that position for years. Mm -hmm. And you would think that David would be doing everything in his human ability to get into that position because he's been given that authority, right? And yet we, what we see is David has the opportunity at least once, if not a couple of times, 
to go ahead and take Saul's life and would have been very easy to do that. And somewhere in David's wisdom, he knew that there was a fine line between pushing ahead under your own agenda and waiting on the, on the Lord to do things in his timing. Yeah. And I think that's, I think that's the key that I've learned in my own life is, uh, and I didn't do it very well early on. Um, yeah. I, I made a switch from teaching. As you said, I was a teacher, public school teacher for a while. And I went from that very, uh, stable job where I had a paycheck and healthcare and I went straight into commission sales in real estate, which is just an awful switch because uh, they don't pay you if you don't do anything in commission right. sales. <laughs> it's, it's a little bit of a difference. And I had a, I had a horrible first year. I didn't sell anything for the first nine months. We went uh, a, a year's worth of income in, into debt. And um, I was just trying everything I knew how to do, like full steam ahead. And um, we didn't respond well to that circumstance. Um, we didn't trust God uh, that he was at work and that he was uh, going to use me. And just maybe his timing was a little different than mine. Um, and so I just kept doing what I knew to do. I just kept, um, I knew that we had been called back to our hometown. I knew that this job, um, I needed to give it a, a good shot. And so I just stuck with it. And when it came to a pivot point where I had to decide, am I going to keep doing this or go back and teach? Because I had taken a year's leave of absence. God sort of stepped in in a dramatic way. And he had used everything that I had previously done. Like, for instance, uh, even though I didn't have any sales in that first nine months, I had started working with a builder uh, yeah. free on my own time. I had started sitting open houses with no compensation, and I had been doing that for months. And it just so happened, and this is how God works, right? It just so happened that when God decided to move and activate some things that um, had been put in place, that builder expanded his territory, got another subdivision. I inherited some listings, and that sort of completely changed the picture. Yeah. And yet, had you talked to me about six weeks before that, I was depressed. I wasn't getting out of bed. I was questioning whether I was doing the right stuff, whether I was in the right place. And yet, God used what I had been doing in preparation. And I think a lot of times, we spent more time in preparation in our lives than in the actual achieving what it is we think we need to achieve. And a lot of that is just waiting on God's timing. And there's a fine line there because sometimes God says, Hey, get on your horse and let's go yeah. do this. I mean, I mean, um, coming the Israelites, uh, another old Testament <laughs> example, the Israelites coming out of Egypt, um, God said, Hey, it's time to get going. Let's, Let's go into the place of rest that I've prepared for you. And um, it, was, it wasn't time to just sit back and wait on God's timing. It was, it was then. Yeah. So I do think there are times in our life where we uh, need to just go ahead uh, under the assumption and the understanding that God has cleared a path for us in mm -hmm. a certain direction. He's given, us, he's given us gifts and talents to use. Uh, different from other people's gifts and talents. And that's how we kind of know where our sweet spots are. And he's given us avenues uh, to go pursue those, maybe expected avenues that we would really enjoy. But sometimes there are avenues in our sweet spots that we wouldn't normally choose on our own. And so I think listening to God along the way and just being willing, I call it testing the waters of rest. Um, yeah. Rest. Uh, I talk about rest in more more terms of soul rest, not physical a lack of physical activity. When my soul is at rest, I I'm in my place and I'm doing my thing. Yeah. And right before before we go into the subject of rest, before we get too yeah. far away, there was something that you said that I want to ask a question about. You said many times it's just our natural inclination just to push through and do. But oftentimes we need to rest and wait. How does one discern the difference of knowing when it's time to do and when it's time to wait? Because to your point, 
there's some scenarios, it's not cookie cutter to so that, you know, in this scenario, it's going to be that. So how does someone discern whether or not God is telling them, I want you to be in a doing season versus I want you to be in a resting and waiting season? Yeah. And I, and I would even approach that question a little bit differently because okay. I believe resting again, because I, I'm approaching rest as more of a soul condition instead of a physical activity. So mm -hmm. I can be at rest, but I can also be very active in my rest. Okay. In other words, I can, if I'm in my sweet spot doing my thing, like when I was a, when I was a pastor and I got to get up in front and, and preach or teach, um, I, I, I was just in my spot. I mean, mm -hmm. there's one of the things some people just absolutely hate doing that. I get juiced up by doing that. So, um, and yet when I'm doing that, I'm usually exhausted in the process because I put everything I have into it. So when I'm in my sweet spot, when we as humanity are in our sweet spots and pursuing what we believe to be the way we're supposed to be going, um, our soul can be at rest, even though if you look at us uh, at an outward position, we might be terribly busy. So yeah. how do we discern the two is the question, right? Yeah. How do we decide to wait or move forward? And I think life circumstances will sometimes do that. The example I gave, uh, I was doing everything I possibly could for nine months. And literally, it was the first time in my life that I had thrown everything in the kitchen sink at something and gotten little to no results. Yeah. And when I say that, I'm saying that because that was my perspective. I was getting no results from my perspective. And my perspective was a paycheck. And God's perspective that I learned later was a little different than that. He was, he was saying, you know what, now is the time to put things in place. Now's the time you may not see the results that you expect or want, but let's remember who's in charge of this whole thing. Uh, that's, that's why I love going back to days one through six, because it's in those first six days that God organizes and give function and order to all of the cosmos. Yeah. And then he invites us into that function and order. And as long as we operate within his parameters, that's the story of Adam and Eve, right? As long as we're functioning within his parameters, we are in a place of rest with him because he's ruling and he wants us to rule alongside with him uh, as a co-venture, right? Yeah. Um, so if you find yourself in a spot in life where it seems like nothing's working. Um, that may be a time to start thinking about, well, is there anything else that God's bringing across my plate at this time? Is there something I've ignored because maybe I've been so laser focused in one area? Maybe God's brought a couple conversations. Maybe even somebody's invited me into something that I just said, no, now's not the time because I'm so into this over here. I, what I like to think is, uh, my use, the best use of my authority that God's given me is listening to where he's leading me. Yeah. And then when I can discern that, then that's an invitation to go and do. That's the invitation to do what I've been gifted to do and have the authority to do within God's kingdom. Yeah, that is so good. You know, and sometimes it's, it's, you, you have to look and see how God responds because I, what I, you know, what I don't want people to think is like, well, if I'm not able to discern the difference that I just don't do anything at all, because I've right. found that oftentimes we don't have to know, right? Like if we, if we feel like we don't 100% know that this is what God is saying, then we just won't do anything at all. <laughs> and I say, there's going to be a lot of times that you're not going to know, but unless what it is that you're sensing is contrary to what his word would say in some shape or form, then just take a step and see how he responds. Because sometimes that's when you can really tell whether or not you're, I, I liken him to a GPS. You know, if you went left and what he really wanted you to do was go right, he knows how to, he knows how to course correct you. But if reroute, we just yeah. stay still because we don't have absolute clarity and confirmation, then we're never we're always going to miss the mark, you know, unless he just forces us, you know, into something. But if we're really wanting to get into this, 
this, um, I don't want to call it a stride, but that's the word that's come into my mind. We really want to get in tune with being able to hear and discern what it is that he either wants us to see or learn or be or do or whatever the, the case may be and, and get in a rhythm. That's probably a better word. Get in a rhythm of when he's calling us to act and when he's calling us to, to not act. Sometimes you're not going to know until you do what it is that you think he's sensing you to do and then see how he responds. Yeah. So one of the examples I give in my book, because I, I talk about testing the waters of rest and again, yeah. rest being your soul rest, being in your place, doing your thing under God's given authority. Um, we can be at rest and terribly active in our life. And I, I talk about testing the waters and I use that analogy because I'm a swimmer and I love swimming laps. I, I do it almost every day. But the one thing I hate about that process is the initial getting into the pool because it seems like no matter what condition my body's in, that water is always really cold. And yeah. I hate that, right? And once you're in, you know, 10, 15 seconds into it, it's a distant memory and it's no problem. But it's that initial shock of getting in. So what I've done when I swim is I've got this very elaborate process that I go through. I sit on the edge of the pool. I swing one leg in. I dip my toe in, my foot. I splash some water up. The second foot goes in. And I'm testing the waters before I just fully jump into something. And I think we can do the same thing in life. I think that's what God expects us to do is he's going to bring stuff across our plate that's within the gifting that he's given us to do. These are things not that uh, we don't necessarily, we don't want to do. These are things we're going to be jazzed about because they're within our gifting. He's yes. going to be calling you to things that you already do well, or that you have the potential to do well. And that's a big difference because if we only focus on what we know we do well, and we never look at the growth potential of what we could do well, that's the vision that God has for us. And that's why listening to him is so important because he'll bring something across your plate that you would never have chosen on your own. But if you're willing to test those waters, if you're willing to like you said, take that initial step, dip a toe in there and test it out. What you might find is, wow, that is a great fit. And I would have never known that. You might also find out, because this has happened to me, you might also get into a situation and say, that's horrible. <laughs> I'm never going to do that again. But you know what? While I was there, I learned something about myself that I would have never known. And now I can see why this opportunity X behind me that I'd never considered before. I'm going to give that a shot because it's totally different than what I just tried, but it has some of the same characteristics. And God does a great job of giving us gifts and talents, giving us authority and leading us into positions where we can be successful for his kingdom if we allow him to do that. Um, one of the scriptures I always go to is Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 through 30. It's Jesus's come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden. And who does uh, that describes everybody, right? Right. <laughs> <laughs> and he it's says, I'll give you another. Exactly. And he says, I'll give you rest. And again, rest is not a day off from physical activity. Rest, the concept that he's talking about, we know because it says it later in a couple of verses is I'm going to give you rest for your soul. Yeah. I'm going to put you in a place where you know you are supposed to be, and I'm going to give you the gifts and talents, and I'm going to actually lead you to that spot if you allow me. And how is that done? He says, take my yoke upon you. And a lot of people never make this connection about this scripture. They listen to the weary and heavy laden, and they're so identified with that portion of it that they never get to the next verse. And Jesus is saying, I've got an instrument of work, a yoke that you put on your back, you'd willingly need to do this, put that yoke on your back and hitch yourself to my kingdom. And I hold the reins, but I'm also right there beside you yoked in, in Jesus's humanity. He did it for us. A, a good example. He's leading. He's the, he's the power partner in the pair. And when we allow ourselves to be yoked to Jesus, what that is, is not just the 
all out ability or desire to go wherever we want to go, whenever we want to do it. It's that gent listening to that gentle tug of the reins that Christ has on us now that we've yoked ourselves to him. And it's interesting that Jesus seems to make that as an option for believers. Yeah. Take and because there's a lot of believers out there that are weary and heavy laden, and they don't want to be yoked. They just want to be free. Yeah. And part of this whole thing, and I said early, it's a fine line, right? Because um, we've been given authority to move and do, but we've also been given parameters. And in the Old Testament, that was the Garden of Eden for Adam and Eve, and they decided not to play by the rules, so they got kicked out of their rest. And in the New Testament, we see Jesus saying, you know what, there's still parameters, we're mm -hmm. still going to give you guidance, and a direction, and show you, we're going to, he says, I'm going to lead you to the work that you've been created to do. And it's there that you're going to find rest for your soul. Yeah. And I don't know anywhere else that I'd like to be than in but that spot. I, I, I'm just fascinated by this concept of soul rest, you know, and, you know, and I think you said it perfectly when you said, you know, you can be at rest yet still be fully in, engaged in activity. So we're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, I actually want to get into some tips of how we can begin to achieve this level of rest. So we'll be right back. This episode is brought to you by the free guide, When God Says Shift. Inside, you'll discover the four shifts required to reveal God's plan, to ditch disruption or delay, and get his blessings faster. Head to GodSaysShift.com to access it now. All right. Welcome back, everyone. So before the break, Greg was just sharing with us this concept of soul rest. And I am in total agreement. The fact that rest, when used properly and when we're discussing the right type of rest, is in itself a form of authority. I believe that resting in the natural is a form of authority because sometimes we're just burning at both ends and we're completely, you know, burning ourselves out. And I do and I do believe that this level of soul rest that you're talking about can be a form of authority as well. So if someone is listening to this episode, Greg, and they're like, I am very much in agreement with the fact that I need to get to a level of soul rest, especially if that is part of the equation of me being um, freed from the, the burdens and the heaviness that I've been carrying around. And I've heard that scripture before, but I have no idea how to put that yoke on me so that I can achieve this level of soul rest. If someone is listening to this episode right now and they feel like they are in that situation, what would be the best tip that you would give them of, how, of what they should be doing in this process in order to yoke up with God and in, in order to get this level of soul rest that you're describing? Yeah, so uh, the analogy, you talked about the the physicality of, of need for rest, and I totally agree with you. We, we often go way too hard, way too fast, and we need breaks in our day. So I'm not saying by any means that we shouldn't be resting physically. I'm just saying that when Jesus spoke about this idea, he was more concerned about uh, someone's soul right. than their outward behavior. And he, and he does that with a lot of topics, not yeah. just this idea of rest. So, um, so one of the things is number one, we need to be listening to our bodies. And I think you mentioned that, and that's very important. If you've, uh, burnt, been burning things at both ends, uh, in uh, per, the pursuit of something that you thought was maybe even the right thing to do. And maybe it is, maybe it's not, I don't know, but if we are physically stressed to the point that uh, we're not rested physically, then we're not going to be able to listen very well to what God might have. I've listened to a few of your podcasts, and a lot of the people are saying, you know, take time to listen to God. And I think that's um, very important as long as we don't get stuck there, right? Yes. Because people can listen to God for years and, oh, like, I'm just still waiting for him to show me my ministry. And 
the the thing is god's given you a ministry and um he's offering to lead you to it and you just need to be willing to step into that and so number one is backing away making sure you're taking care of your health your physical health um part of adam and eve's mandate back there is to cultivate and keep the garden and that um i i say that you need to be cultivating and keeping your health number one so if you're not sleeping well figure out why that is and make moves to correct that because when we're not sleeping well um somebody can be talking to us face to face and giving us truth and we're not going to hear it because yeah. we're so distracted or we're concerned about our body or body's response to whatever so number 1 that's highly important once we get that under control or we're working on that um because i think that's a continual process of mm -hmm. you know as you go I think um, resetting towards rest is another thing that I have in my last chapter um, is just this idea of on a regular basis, and this can be this can be a monthly basis. You take a day or a few days away from whatever it is you normally do. Uh, kind of a Sabbath idea from a seventh day Sabbath idea where we were breaking a cycle to reconsider some things, but a little more directed in the sense that you want to take regular breaks away from what you do to just reassess, is this really where I've been called? Mm. Is this really in a place of my gifting, where I've landed? And I, I use the example of when I was a pastor, I've, I felt called to take a position in youth ministry. I had some youth ministry background. Uh, there was a job opening. Everything fit and meshed perfectly together. The timing was great. I knew I was exactly in the right spot. But then some of my life circumstances changed with my immediate family. And then the church's circumstances changed with the exit of the head pastor and a new head pastor coming in. And a few years later, I found myself not just doing youth ministry, but I found myself through no fault of anybody really, um, just I had three or four different ministries and I was getting burnt out at both ends and it was all good work. I mean, yeah. I was, I was gifted to do it. I had the skills to do it, but it was in a time of reflection that I took uh, for myself, uh, one of these resetting towards rest. And I was asking myself, okay, what am I doing currently? What opportunities are available to me? And am I in the best spot? And if you can answer any of those on your own, just intuitively, I believe God's given you uh, the ability to, to know things about yourself. If you're not quite sure, there's a lot of different avenues you can go to. You can, you can talk to other people that you trust. Hopefully you have people in your life that understand who you are and how you've been gifted and can be an encouragement to say, you know what, it's time to just camp where you're at because you're in a season and God's using you mightily and, and you just need to push through this, or uh, maybe they'll see uh, something that you can't see because you're blind to it. And they'll say, you know what, maybe it's time to shift. And maybe if you ask to be moved to that position, that would free you up to do something different that you haven't experienced. So these times away, there's resetting towards rest, I think is one of the keys in exercising the authority that we've already been given mm -hmm. it's taking these times to say am i still on the right path you talked about the gps uh, analogy uh, i love that because as soon as you make the wrong turn gps is all over you right yeah it's like rerouting re rerouting re rerouting re -routing. <laughs> take a u-turn take a u-turn but sometimes they'll not say don't take a u-turn oh i got a better way to get you there right keep going straight and take a left up in a couple blocks and so that's what we need to be doing. And if you can do that monthly, great. If you can do that weekly, better. The goal really, um, the author of Hebrews talks about the, the rest that's available to believers um, that we don't just naturally step into when we come to faith. It says, be diligent to step into this, believers. So it's, a, it's an option, it's a choice. They say today, if you hear his voice. Don't respond like those Israelites coming out of Egypt uh, who are, became hard-hearted and missed their opportunity at rest, being at rest in their souls in the promised land, right? Don't respond like they do. 
And he's quoting a psalm, and the psalm is, today, if you hear his voice. So that yeah. resetting really is a daily thing. So some people find that in a daily devotional or a time of meditation or journaling, or I do it when I swim, <laughs> because that's 45 minutes that I'm not talking to anybody and my phone. Um, I don't have a phone that's waterproof, so I can't take it in the water. <laughs> <laughs> Thank God they haven't created that, or maybe they have. I think they have. I just haven't bought it yet. <laughs> so I think those are kind of the two things. Just listen to your own body first, and because your body's going to tell you if you're not in the right spot. Yeah. It, uh, just physically. Your physical responses are going to tell you. My wife's the counselor. She... <laughs> She just says, uh, oftentimes when I'm with a client, I just tell them, what's your body telling you? And yeah. I think we have been become desensitized to that in our culture because we, again, we just want to push forward uh, with whatever it is we're doing because we want to be active and we think activity is always the best thing. But sometimes it's not. Sometimes taking that break, resetting towards rest, uh, changing our course a little bit. Uh, those are all important things. Yeah, I love that. You know, I say that there's it, no coincidence that we're called human beings and not human doings. But not only do we always focus on what it is that we should do, I find that that's one of the number one questions that we're always asking God to Lord, what do you want me to do? And sometimes, you know, he's not giving you the doing because he needs you to focus on who you're going to become. And if we'll focus on who it is that we need to become, and to me, becoming is you know, adopting certain strengths and getting rid of, of certain weaknesses, then oftentimes the doing takes care of itself. And the Lord is not going to give you what to do if you haven't yet become the person that's going to be able to handle it. So I love the fact that, that you're, that you're giving us this equation um, because sometimes at the end of this equation is not, or in the process of the equation is not always going to be what it is that we can do. And that's something that we have to unlearn because there was a season that I went through when I was being first called to ministry that even though he, he showed me what the ministry was going to consist of, he hadn't given me the how yet. And so I had to say, okay, well, what do I need to to do in the meantime. And it was like, no, who do I need you to become? What version of Shana do I need you to amplify? What strengths does Shana have that I need you to amplify? And what weaknesses does Shana have that I need you to shed in order to be ready to do what it is that I'm, that I'm calling you to do? So I love how all of this just, this fits together. Like it's a, it's a piece to a puzzle. And um, I'm grateful that you were here to really help us get into this place of soul rest. So Greg, before we begin to wrap up, are there any final words that you would have for the audience? Yeah, so I, I spoke about David earlier. Again, I'm an Old Testament guy. So um, David's anointed king. It's years before he actually takes the throne. But if you read this story, there are some very pivotal things that happen before he God allows him into that role. And one of those things is the great story of David and Goliath. And I hate to promote violence and, you know, death and all that, but it's part of the biblical story. Yeah, sometimes it's necessary. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah. <laughs> but David, David is called into life circumstances that, that put him in a place, not just in his own confidence, but also in the vision of those around him, the nation of Israel they were ready for him to be king because of what he had done in the interim. And I think that interim process or that interim time is what we don't like to focus on because it seems like we're unproductive. Mm -hmm. And if we can just know that everything's working towards one end, if we've got that yoke on our back and God's guiding us, um, we can wait on his timing. We can trust him in that. And yet we can still be actively working towards where we think he's guiding and leading us. And then, like it always happens, it, it, it just seems to, the floodgates seem to open. And sometimes that's, you know, a good job or a relationship, but sometimes it's just the very small things that God brings us in that have been uh, kind of in our way, holding us back, and he opens a door and it's like, oh, I'm so glad I didn't get here sooner because I had to learn a lesson before I got here. And God does that for us. I love that. 
Absolutely. Great, great, great words. Um, so Greg, how can they find you and follow you? Yeah, so I've got two websites. Uh, one is attached to my book. My book is Rethinking Rest. And so I've got rethinkingrest.com. And the cool thing about Rethinking Rest, uh, it's a good devotional book. It'd be a good small group study. I've also got a fully developed fall, a small group study on my website for free. So if you buy that, you can go through my study. It's all available there. I've got QR codes in the book, goes takes you right to it. My other uh, website is rethinkingscripture.com. So rethinkingrest.com, rethinkingscripture.com. And that's attached to my website or that's attached to my podcast. So okay, perfect. Yeah. And do you have any social media that you would like to give them? Well, I'm on Facebook at Rethinking Scripture. I'm on Instagram. I'm on TikTok. I, I, I got my mom on TikTok over uh, my book launch. Uh, I handed her my book and filmed it. So my mom's famous now. She has no idea what TikTok is, but, and I'm also on uh, YouTube. You can find all that stuff though. If you just Google me or I'm sure you'll put it in the show notes. I absolutely will make sure that all of this is in the show notes. So Greg, thank you so much for sharing the nuggets. I love the diversity of the conversations of people's different perspective about how we exercise our kingdom authority. So everyone, thank you for listening to this episode. Share, 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 because we all need to learn how to get into this place of soul rest. It's part of the equation. We cannot get into the destiny that God has for us without this level of rest. So share this episode far and wide so that everyone that you know and love can get into a state of soul rest. Greg, thank you so much for being here, everyone. I pray that this episode has blessed you and I will see you back here next week for another episode of A God Shift. Everyone take care. Bye-bye.